Good morning, dear colleagues here in the room and also all of you uh, from remote. I hope that you have been enjoying our incredible program so far. We have so much more in store for you today. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's plenary lecture. This lecture, a very interesting lecture entitled Digitalization and Innovation, Success Factors for the Future, encapsulates some of the core values of the ECR, focusing on the future of radiology. I am delighted to welcome an expert in this area, the CEO of the Roche Group, Dr. Severin Schwann from Basel, Switzerland. Dr. Schwann's career at Roche Basel began in 1993, and after holding numerous managing positions in Belgium, Germany, and Switzerland, Dr. Schwann became the regional head of the Roche Diagnostics business for Asia Pacific in 2004 and moved to Singapore. He was appointed CEO of Roche Diagnostics in 2006, and he remained in that position until 2008 when he became the CEO of the entire Roche Group. He became a member of the Roche Board in 2013 and has held that position ever since. I have invited Severin to share with us, as a leader of a pharma company, his vision on how digitalization can bring innovation in the field of personalized medicine. In line with the Building Bridges team, I am convinced that knowing the different viewpoints of our partners will help us to better understand how we can address the challenges in this field together. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Schwann. Seferin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Regina. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here in Vienna. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Regina for having the courage uh, to invite me to this conference. Uh, after all, uh, I'm not a radiologist, and actually my company, Roche, is not directly engaged in radiology. In fact, uh, we have two businesses, pharmaceuticals on the one hand, and diagnostics on the other hand, and our strategy is very much about personalized healthcare. That is, uh, you know, for example, developing companion diagnostics uh, to enable targeted uh, treatments. Now, in future, we want to bring personalized healthcare uh, to a new level by leveraging big patient data sets. Um, and uh, leveraging advanced analytics. And I think it's exactly in this field where our disciplines on the pharma side, on the in vitro diagnostic sites where we are active in, uh, bring us much closer uh, to radiology, and I'll, I'll touch on that um, in a moment. What I thought uh, to uh, start with and to frame my presentation is just remind us again of a typical uh, patient journey, which would uh, start with an early uh, personalized diagnosis. I will come back to that uh, in a moment. That forms uh, the basis for uh, a personalized care plan. Uh, and uh, that plan will decide on whether uh, you go for an approved intervention, for example, a medicine which has been approved by regulatory authorities, or whether a patient uh, would enter a clinical trial. You would then monitor the outcome, um, and depending on how the disease uh, develops, uh, the cycle starts over again. Along the way, obviously, we collect lots of data um, which can improve this cycle, this patient uh, journey. And if we get that right, uh, it's pretty intuitive that, first and foremost, uh, uh, that's uh, a big benefit for patients as uh, they would receive better um, outcomes and, and a better experience. Obviously, for providers, um, uh, they can be recognized for high-quality healthcare. And I would argue also from a payer perspective, 
Um, there's a, a big benefit here because if you get the diagnosis right from the beginning, if you get immediately to the right treatment, you avoid a lot of waste in the healthcare system. So let's have a bit of a closer look in uh, you know, how we think about uh, personalized diagnosis. And what we really see is a confluence of disciplines, in particular for complex, more heterogeneous diseases uh, like cancer. Uh, in a tumor board session, for example, uh, you would typically combine the sequence of the tumor uh, with, with imaging, which you bring in as radiologists. Uh, you would have uh, the standard parameters from the central lab, um, and of course, in particular for solid tumors, uh, uh, the tissue from pathology is very important. Combining all of that with clinical data should then help us to hopefully uh, find a very personalized uh, and, and uh, helpful diagnosis for the individual patient. Now, what I should say today, if you look at the clinical practice, in my experience, I mean, it's already a challenge to get all these kind of data together. And only a few patients, uh, for example, cancer patients, would have the benefit going through a tumor board um, and, and, and having all the specialists talk with each other and bring this information together. But on top of it, and this is my point, and this is where I'll focus on, we are not leveraging the data. I mean, this kind of stuff lies next to each other. Uh, you know, people sometimes even bring paper uh, to the sessions or an image. You have it perhaps, and that's already the best case, all on one screen with some reports, but we are not leveraging the data as such. And I think here is an enormous opportunity um, as we go forward. And, and let me, let me uh, dive a little bit into, into that specific uh, topic. Uh, now, first of all, if we talk about data, um, we, we, we know that we have two sources. One is clinical trials. On the clinical trial side, the big advantage is that there is a huge depth of data, um, high quality regulatory grade uh, data, uh, which typically uh, you, you do not have uh, on the clinical practice side uh, to, to, you know, to this degree of, of breath and death. However, uh, in the clinical practice, by far the majority of data obviously is collected. Only a fraction of patients go on clinical trials. So it's about 4% of data we would be able to get from clinical trials. They will remain very important, of course. But there's this huge opportunity, the other part of the data, 96% of the data, which we could leverage actually for two purposes. On the one hand, and that's where we come in as, as, a, as a pharma company, very interested in this kind of data uh, to, uh, to uh, do research and development uh, for our uh, new medicines. Um, it's likewise, of course, uh, a very rich source for academic institutions. And on the other hand, I have no doubt, and I will, I will uh, you know, demonstrate this with, with two examples, um, eventually this will also help to improve the treatment um, in, the, in the daily praxis uh, with uh, corresponding clinical decision support systems. Right, so uh, let me start uh, with, with one example we are working on. Uh, Roche is very uh, engaged and focused uh, in oncology, and here I have an example with prostate cancer, where we are also doing clinical trials. Now, um, if you, if you uh, look at prostate cancer, um, uh, the aggressiveness of the cancer um, and to know the aggressiveness of the cancer is really, really important because um, uh, that uh, uh, is the prerequisite uh, for treatment decisions. Treatment decisions are very different depending on how aggressive this kind of, of cancer is. But it's also very important for clinical trials and how you design clinical trials. So you need this information. Now, the gold standard here is the Gleason grade. Uh, this is derived from tissue. Um, and, um, uh, and you analyze uh, the, the, the stain, uh, give a certain grade, and depending on the grade, um, you would uh, judge the aggressiveness of the prostate cancer. This is the gold standard. 
Now, it's not perfect. We also have uh, variability, uh, you know, between different centers. Uh, you know, the same people look at the same slide. Uh, uh, different people look at the, at the same slide, and, and, and uh, sometimes you get a different grading, uh, but it's the best we have today. Um, now, as you can imagine, um, uh, if you go into clinical trials, and, and certainly the same is true in the clinical practice, um, this is not very convenient for the patient. You have to take a biopsy. Um, as a limit of how many biopsies you can take, and for a clinical trial on top of it increases the cost uh, uh, of, of a trial and, and uh, delays the recruitment of patients. So what we are looking at is, can we um, perhaps avoid biopsies altogether? And for that purpose, what we are doing is we are working together with institutions where we um, share huge data sets uh, with PTCT scans, um, and we are looking of whether we can actually get the same information, whether we can replace the traditional Gleason score which we get from a, from a uh, tissue slide, whether we can replace that um, with uh, just looking at, at uh, the PTCT scan. Now, the human eye would not be able um, uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, but what we have seen now, it looks extremely promising, is that if you have large enough data sets, if you run um, artificial intelligence, machine learning over those images, and suddenly um, you see a strong correlation with the, with the uh, Gleason grade, uh, and in fact, from what we see now, it might even be better and more reliable uh, than the traditional method. So this has all been done so far retrospectively, uh, retrospectively with real-world data, um, and uh, eventually we have to validate that uh, in the best case with prospective studies. And this is interesting because here as a pharma company, we have the clinical trials running anyway. So we can take this hypothesis, we can look at uh, uh, this uh, digital biomarker, if you like, um, and design our clinical trials accordingly. So this is really, really uh, exciting uh, stuff. It will help us to hopefully develop better medicines, be able to much better evaluate whether a new medicine is differentiated versus the standard of care, uh, and you can obviously see the benefit this would bring um, in the clinical practice uh, if introduced accordingly. Now let me give you um, a second, also very, and, and I should say typical example of what is happening here and, and how disciplines are coming uh, together. And that's, um, uh, again, uh, an example in, in, in cancer, DLBCL, uh, an aggressive form of, of lymphoma. Uh, and same story, um, you, you have to know how aggressive uh, the specific cancer is. That's uh, extremely important in terms of the treatment decision, um, and it's also very important uh, for, for clinical trials. So typically, if you have an aggressive form of DLBCL, and you would also immediately uh, start with an aggressive treatment, which you would perhaps not do if it's a less aggressive uh, form of, of, of cancer. Um, and um, uh, we have also seen the benefit um, of having this information in clinical trials, or actually we have challenges when we do clinical trials. Um, and the reason is as follows. The, the, the gold standard for, for uh, deciding on how aggressive this form of blood cancer is, uh, is the so-called standard IPI. So this is a score which has been established back in the 90s, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and uh, it continues to be the gold standard. Um, and it's cumbersome, it takes time. So if you look at it from a pharma company point of view, who is doing clinical trials, what we have faced is that by the time this test is done, by the time we have this uh, standard IPI, we have already lost patients, or we have patients who cannot enter uh, the trial anymore because the disease is so aggressive, right? So we have a very genuine interest to have better methods, more efficient methods, cheaper methods, uh, less invasive methods, etc. Now, uh, what we are doing is two things, and again, the results are very promising. Um, and and uh, by the way, and the data sets we use here, again, we need huge data sets. Um, here, it's a bit the other way around, whereas in the previous example with prostate cancer, we use real-world data 
to establish the hypothesis. So here we have another opportunity, and that is going back to our clinical trial data sets. It happens to be that in this specific field, we have done a range of uh, clinical trials uh, with a range of different molecules. So we have a huge data set, and these are very deep uh, data sets uh, where we have clinical uh, history, clinical outcomes, where we follow those patients longitudinally. Uh, we have the imaging data, we have the pathology data, etc. So we have a rich data set. And um, what we do here is we take, on the one hand, the PET scans. And this is the simple routine PET scans, nothing special. That's a PET scan any radiologist could do anywhere, uh, you know, with standard uh, methods. Uh, and we have developed uh, algorithms which automatically um, calculate the total metabolic tumor uh, volume. Um, and what we see is that is actually very precise um, and uh, if less variability, it's more comprehensive than, than what we see otherwise uh, in clinical practice. Um, and uh, uh, we have come to the conclusion based on our data, it's actually better, I mean, at least as good as the standard IPI um, in determining um, uh, the aggressiveness. Now, specifically in, in our case, to predict uh, uh, what is the, the relapse rate uh, within two years. So this is one path uh, we have gone, and, and it looks extremely promising based on a rich uh, uh, database. Now, the second approach is uh, that we look at routine H&E stains, normal H&E stains. I mean, nothing special, right? We just look at the H&E stains, and we have done exactly the same. So we match uh, the H&E stains uh, with the clinical outcomes. Uh, and uh, because we have enough data, we can apply machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence. And again, what we see is that we are at least as good as um, the standard IPI in, in this uh, respective field. And what we are doing now is actually combining the information. So we go beyond just one discipline. We are taking uh, the slides on the one hand from pathology and uh, the images from radiology and the intent is, uh, and that's what we are looking at, whether we can get to even more accuracy um, and getting uh, better in our prediction uh, about relapse rates um, uh, within two days, uh, two years. So, so this is uh, super exciting. It's super exciting for us as a pharma company which is developing new medicines, uh, but I think it should be super exciting for all of us as this clearly would improve uh, clinical care um, over time. Now, uh, let, me, let me just uh, uh, spend uh, a moment on, how shall I say, the, the challenges or the prerequisites or the hurdles uh, which we face on the real world uh, data side. Now, uh, one is clearly uh, data quality. When we work together with institutions, um, you know, lots of, of, of institutions say, well, can we work together, let's have a look. Uh, uh, and, and often the data quality is just uh, not sufficient for our purposes. Um, and often uh, the data are not connected, right, along the patient. So you might have some sequencing data, that's all fine, but they are not connected to clinical outcome data. Uh, you might have imaging data, but you don't have the patient history. Um, and even more so, what is also very critical in a field like, like, like cancer, where it's a lot about resistance, relapses, etc., as the cancer evolves over time, as we all know, um, we don't have longitudinal data. So we might have some data, but we don't have them over time. So the quality of the data is, is often very poor, really, really poor. Uh, most of those efforts are just useless because the data are so poor. I, 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 I have to say, I have to go so far that in certain countries in Europe, I mean, the data are not even captured. Uh, if you look uh, to Germany, if you look to Switzerland, uh, you know, there is not even a, a systematic uh, patient health record in place. It's not mandatory, right, like it is the case in, 
in other countries and in particular in the US for already a long time. So this is a huge, a huge topic. And uh, I do believe, coming back to this point of working across disciplines, we all have to work on that, right? Uh, uh, the providers, the different disciplines, uh, the providers, including radiology, uh, uh, we on the industry side, um, governments, payers, regulators, whomever it takes. Uh, this is a real issue. And I should say, if I look at it from my perspective, uh, what I see is that Europe is falling behind. Big time, big time. If I look at the investments we have in this area, the vast majority has moved to the United States, um, and China actually is putting a lot of uh, resources into this area. There are some, you know, efforts in Europe uh, uh, and in specific countries, but but uh, we are running behind uh, big time. Now, second point, it goes without saying uh, that patient data. Uh, have to be de-identified. Uh, de de um, and data privacy, data security, of course, is a huge uh, topic. Uh, um, and and uh, it's, it's also a huge uh, topic in, 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 the, in the public domain, right? Um, and I, I, you know, I, I should say this has an impact um, uh, on, on our work that has an impact uh, on how providers uh, deal with this topic. I mean, I have had uh, situations where I was talking with uh, very renowned hospitals in Europe, typically public hospitals, where, 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 the, where the leadership in these hospitals said, well, listen, actually it makes a lot of sense. We should work together, but I have a real issue because if I work with you, the industry, this is regarded as, uh, you know, tricky and I don't want to be on the front page of a newspaper. It doesn't make sense, but you know the reputational uh, risk is too high. I should say this is a bit shifting now post-COVID because people by and large have recognized that data are not uh, necessarily a threat, but, but, but can also be an opportunity. But it's a real issue uh, we are dealing with. And, and what, I, what I keep saying is, um, you know, what people mix up, not the specialists, but the general public is that, um, in unlike the consumer tech companies, right, who are interested in very personalized uh, data because they do their advertising and they want to track down uh, the IP address of, of the user, in the pharmaceutical industry, of course, we are not interested in personalized data at all. What we need is aggregated, de-identified data, and that's actually what we do with clinical trials uh, in the case of Roche since over 100 years, and we have hundreds of thousands of patients where we get exactly this de-identified uh, data uh, every day. And, you know, there can be a lot of discussion and concerns about the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, but I've never heard a single case where this industry didn't deal responsibly um, with, with patient data. Not a single case. I'm not aware of it. Uh, on the contrary, I mean, this is so much embedded that we take care of that. And also from a business model point of view, I'm not interested in the individual patient. All I'm interested in is to develop a medicine for all patients who have a certain disease. It's completely the reverse business model to the, um, uh, you know, to the tech companies, Facebook, Google, and whatever, who uh, actually want to go back to the individual PC to individualize the advertising. What we want is aggregated, de-identified data, which are the basis for developing medicine for everybody. So to get this across in the public debate is super, super difficult. And uh, I mean, uh, it, it can really be a blockage, in particular in Europe, again, because the majority of providers in Europe, hospitals, etc., are public ones. And for them, uh, this is even more difficult uh, than for private institutions in the US and in China. I mean, they anyway have a top-down uh, approach where this doesn't matter at all. So these fears um, are a real kind of uh, hurdle. And, and I, I think, again, we have to work together and use every opportunity to show the value and the opportunities of data for better health care. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Good, I have to watch the time. I know you're very kind of uh, tight program, Regina. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, perhaps just say one word on data volume interoperability. I'm sorry to say it's a European Congress, but again, Europe has a structural disadvantage. 
Now, in the US, um, huge providers, um, and uh, you know, with some of those providers, I get more data than in the whole country uh, in Europe, right? I mean, the countries are just smaller, it is more fragmented, um, and the interoperability is not here. So I have, I have a problem to get the volume of data. Now, Europe has recognized this. There is this European space project, et cetera, health space or something. Um, well, it's all in its infancy. I mean, it's not in the, in the praxis, you know. It's a good intent, but all of that is already happening in the US and, and, and in, in, uh, uh, in China. And I should also say, it's not only on a European level. I mean, on a national level, there are some nations where this is more aggregated, in the Scandinavian area, for example, but you have other countries, you know, where I come from in Switzerland. I mean, you have a hospital in every canton, uh, uh, and, and they, are, they are not working together. And then if you go a level deeper, even in the hospital, right, the disciplines are not working together. They are completely isolated, sitting here and there. Nobody knows what the other person is doing. The systems are not working, etc. I touched on the lack of electronic and comprehensive electronic data records. So I, I, I mean, you can hear my frustration, I guess. Uh, so let me come uh, to my to my uh, last slide, just to sum up. And this is really a request to you. That's kind of a call to action uh, to make sure that Europe is not falling behind even more as, as, as we are already. First of all, we have to work across disciplines. There is just no doubt that there is a confluence of the disciplines. And, and those who don't do that will be isolated and will kind of disappear over time. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, hopefully a few countries, a few institutions will make a difference because if this is not happening in Europe, I tell you, we will all buy the tools and get all the tools from other countries. And the research and the development and all of that will increasingly shift to those countries where this is actually happening, uh, for example, for clinical trials, uh, research and development. So this is really important. Uh, and, and, you know, my personal experience is uh, very much so on the in vitro diagnostic side that those disciplines are very isolated. Uh, often the molecular lab doesn't speak with the, uh, you know, with the core lab. They don't even know each other sometimes. The sequencing lab is somewhere in a different corner uh, and completely separated. And the radiologist, I mean, if you ask for the name, they don't even know the name. I mean, this is, this is and vice versa, I suppose. So this is a real problem, a real problem. Now, number two, uh, there is no doubt, and I hope I could demonstrate that with, with two examples, and I could give many, many more also in other areas beyond radiology, that data analytics will clearly improve the speed and accuracy of diagnostics, uh, potentially uh, reduces the invasiveness of procedures, and it will certainly also contribute uh, to uh, uh, manage the cost and make healthcare systems uh, sustainable. And I think in this respect, uh, collaborations with industry, research collaborations, et cetera, sharing uh, de-identified data sets uh, can make uh, a, a big difference. Um, and, and it's a lot about mindset. Uh, it's a lot about seeing the opportunity rather than having this Reflex, no, I don't want to work uh, together with, with, with industry. These are kind of the people on the dark side. And, and sometimes I have this impression uh, when I talk to, uh, you know, politicians uh, in, in Europe, decision makers, uh, and when I read the newspaper, which basically reflects the general public opinion. We all have to work to, to, to get to a new level of cooperation, including the industry itself. And then a final point, and then I really close is about reimbursement. Now, um, unlike in the US where you have a private system and uh, typically, you know, uh, the provider would, uh, you know, provide the money where, where the value is um, uh, in a more market-driven system. Uh, in Europe, of course, for everything which you do, you have a separate reimbursement code, uh, typically. Uh, and we know if you don't have reimbursement, there's no adoption. Also, if you don't have reimbursement, um, then there is less incentive for uh, our industry, other industries, digital uh, companies to invest into those solutions. Because uh, if you have to be afraid that you invest a lot of money and you never get a return for it because it will not be adopted uh, in, in the healthcare system, uh, then that can also be a big hurdle. And indeed, it is a hurdle uh, in many countries. There are good exceptions. 
um, but overall, uh, uh, there is more work to do here. Yeah, so to conclude, um, uh, Regina, I really commend you for the, for the title of this Congress. I mean, I couldn't agree more and, and wholeheartedly. Uh, I, I really do believe that the disciplines are coming together and this gets a boost um, with, with the availability of big data, all these modern uh, analytics tools, uh, and we, we should leverage the chances we have also here in Europe. Thank you very much.